Welcome to the next part of the Real-Time Systems module. What we're going to discuss today is digital signal processing. And I'm going to introduce to you some of the terms and some very simple techniques that are used to improve the signal-to-noise ratio that you get from data that comes out of ADCs, transducers and other input devices. Let's just list the systems we're going to go through. We're only going to deal with a few subjects here. You can only do an overview really in the time you have available. We're going to consider low pass filters, running means, smoothing algorithms. Now these three we're going to go into great detail and I would expect you to be able to reproduce the program code to implement those three. In addition, we are going to talk about linear regression and also least squared fits, which is uh, part of that concept, and fast Fourier transforms. These two, you do not need to write any code they're far too difficult to do and in fact you just extract these off of the web or you just get algorithms out of a book you wouldn't develop these yourself so let's run through what are these uh, things doing well all of them are trying to extract good signal from noise and to do that you need to have some knowledge of what the signal looks like in general you would normally sample your signal faster than it is changing. If you don't do that, this is Nyquist's theorem on sampling, then it's impossible for you to monitor your signal. So in general, your signal is, with respect to your sampling rate, a low frequency signal, which you must sample faster than the rate of change of your signal. Otherwise, you just won't see changes. Therefore, by definition, anything that is very high frequency within your signal must be rubbish. It must be noise due to external interference. And most of the techniques I'm going to present to you today are all geared towards removing high frequency interference from low frequency signal. Let's take the simplest. The simplest one is the low pass filter technique and this is a very widely established technique that originally originated in electronics but has got its equivalent in a um, in uh, software now the theory is in electronics if you were to present to a signal a pure resistive path and a capacitive path down to ground and then we were to take that into our ADC. Science tells us that low frequencies will go through the resistor, whereas the high frequencies are bypassed to ground and disposed of. And so this particular electronic circuit, you don't need to remember this because we're not talking about electronics here, but that is the electronic equivalent of a low pass filter. We get rid of the high frequencies, we let the low frequencies pass. Now, there is in fact a direct software equivalent of that electronic circuit. It operates in exactly the same way in terms of the output in that it discards high frequency information and lets low frequencies come through. And the way it's done, I'm not going to prove it to you because we haven't got time for that. You've just got to believe me. If we have a sample data system, so that we have at any time our output at sample time n, if we make that equal to a our input at time n plus b the output at the previous sample, so what we do is we fit literally, if this is our input at time n that goes into our filter, there's our output, we feed back with a time delay our last sample back into our filter using this relationship where A plus B equals 1, that performs the task of a low pass filter. It actually operates in the identical way to the electronic circuit. 
So a small bit of the output, if it's fed back into the input, removes high frequency noise. Now if you don't believe me, you don't have to believe me, you can just take it for fact. That is the program. I'll, I'll try and explain to you very simply why that works. Let's look in time, and bear in mind these are our samples. Let's assume our signal is moving very slowly. Now we know our signal moves slowly because we must sample far faster than the rate of change of our signal, otherwise we'll miss great changes in it. Think what happens to some high frequency noise. So a high frequency moves far, far faster than our low frequency signal. So the way I've drawn here, I've cheated obviously, at this sample point here, our noise is positive. At that sample point here, our noise is negative. So the theory is, if we feed back a little bit of the history into the current position, it will hardly affect our signal because it's moving so slowly. The real signal will hardly be affected at all, but hopefully we are trying to cancel out the positive noise with the negative noise because it's moving far faster. Now bear in mind that was just one sample point, but if you integrate that over the whole frequency spectrum of all the high frequency noise, and you solve that equation, which we're not going to do, you can show that the higher the frequency is, the more it will be cancelled out by this algorithm, and thereby it will get rid of the high frequency noise. Now if we look at the frequency spectrum, what happens when we do that, if I was to do a simple graph here of frequency in that direction, and gain in that direction, that is how much of the signal is allowed to pass, at low frequencies all the signal gets through. If you think about it, if you've got output n equals a, input n plus b, input of n minus 1, if you're hardly moving at all, if that was 8 and that was 8, then the output will be 8. At low frequencies, all the signal gets through. What happens is somewhere up here at high frequencies, this cancellation effect starts working and it drops off nice and steeply, 3 dB per octave, believe it or not, which is the direct equivalent of what happens with the electronic circuit. That is exactly the response characteristic for the ele both the electronics and that equation. And the point at which it drops off is determined by the ratio of A plus B. Now, no more maths. I'm just going to give you that equation. That should have been the output. I'm sorry. You feed back a little bit of the output. So the output at time now is the input now plus a little bit of the previous output and you get a characteristic such as this whereby the high frequency noise drops off. It's such a simple bit of code to write. It's almost second nature. Whenever you do an input from an ADC, you put in a low pass filter. They're so easy to do. So we'll write down the equation again and you could write the code yourself. Output at time n equals some constant a input at time n plus b times a little bit of the last output. And to give you an idea of the ratios, I normally use 7 eighths for a and 1 eighth for b. So what I do is I feed back 1 eighth, the previous result, back into the input. And then I get my response characteristics such as this. And it, that removes the high, very high frequency signals, they're all lost. And so what we have is a very simple bit of code. It uses very little program code. More importantly, it hardly uses any memory. It is incredibly memory efficient. Because all we need to do is to store the last reading and this reading. And if you notice, I used here deliberately 7 eighths and 1 eighths because these are multiplications. But if I use nice binary fractions such as this, I can do this all with very simple, fast 
logical shift and addition operations rather than multiplications. So you can do all this with integer arithmetic in a very tight bit of code um, and just simply uh, shift the input left three bits, lift the, shift that right one bit, add the two together, shift back again three bits. Very quick. You don't need any mass code processor. Very efficient on code. What is the disadvantage though? The advantage is quick, hardly any memory, short bit of code. The disadvantage is because you're always feeding back the history, the output signal has got a lot of historic baggage in it. It takes a long time for the information to decay. So the data you're using now will still have a decaying value from a long, long time ago because it's a feedback process. So advantages, short code, no memory, very easy to do with inter-arithmetic. The bad news is because it's a feedback mechanism, you've always got some old historic data involved in it. So that's a low pass filter. You should be able to write a program that implements that, explain how that works, discuss that, and implement that yourself. That is not difficult. Now let's go to another concept. The other type of filter that is very, very widely used is a concept known as a running mean. A running mean. It's just common sense, in fact. If you go back to that picture I showed you earlier, where we have our signal moving slowly with regular samples, and sitting on top of that is our high frequency noise, common sense tells us that if we take a block of samples in time and simply average them then what will tend to happen is that all the positive and negative noise information will tend to cancel out, whereas our own signal is moving nice and slowly, and that will tend to be, in fact, reinforced by this process. So rather than having the feedback loop with some very ancient data in, with modern computational techniques, why don't we just have an array, an array of data, and we just average it? So instead, what we do as we have an array, typically, not many, typically eight samples. And here we have the most recent sample, input n, to the oldest sample, input n minus 8. And we just take the average of them, divide, add them all together, divide by 8, and we say output at time n equals sigma input from n to n minus 8, all divided the information, average the signal. That is a running mean. Very simple concept. All we do is we take a block of information and we average it. And that is moving in time. Now what's the advantage of that? The advantage of it over the, over the low pass filter is it's only the most recent data. The disadvantage is it needs much more memory because it needs all of the more RAM for the array. And bear in mind, you may have very little memory available. Typical microcontrollers, the PIC processor, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you will have about 30 or 40 bytes of RAM total for the whole of the product, the whole of the program. You don't get kilobytes of memory in these things, you get bytes of memory. So it's very memory intensive, there's more maths there, you've got to maintain a couple pointers. The great advantage of it is, of course, it's only got the most recent data. And so they do the same thing, it has a similar characteristic as the low pass filter, it gets rid of high frequency noise, it's only the most recent information, but it uses far more code, far more data space. There's no reason at all why you shouldn't be able to write programs and running means in as well. Now the third type of program, filter that you need to know about in code, is a thing called a smoothing filter. Now let's look, look closely again at the running mean. With the running mean, we had a whole series of samples. Let's say sample n minus 3, n minus 2, n minus 1, sample n. And then what we were doing was adding them all together 
and dividing by four. So what we were, are doing with this is we're giving equal weight to all of the samples at all time. But that's not reasonable, is it? Because if this is time now, then really we should give more weight to the more recent samples than the older samples. And starting with that as our premise, so we, we have been developed this range of algorithms called the smoothing algorithms. And that's exactly what they do. So instead of giving equal weight to all of our samples, we give them a weighted average. And what we do, if we've got sample, let's say that's sample 8, 7, no, I better use letters or we're going to get into a mess here once I start multiplying them. If we say that is sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, or whatever. What we do, if that is our array of samples, we create a new array with a weighted average, where we take literally one of those, two of those, and one of those. So we say the new D entry is C plus 2 times D plus E divided by 4. And we do that all the way along. So here our new G would become F plus 2 times G plus H divided by 4. So for every one of our entries in our array, we would then generate a new array that is a weighted average of each of those points. But what we're actually doing, in fact, the, the array shrinks by two elements each time you do it. So what you have to do, this is used for post-processing of data. But I have to tell you, if you've got a good enough processor, you can do this in real time and produce some far superior uh, data than using a low-pass filter if you've got the memory and the processing time to do it. So what we're doing is we're taking our array and we're averaging and weighting it and creating a new array. Why does that work? It's, again, it's the same reason. If we go to, here's our sample data system, here's our sample points. Now ideally, at any one point here, our real signal is moving very slowly because we ought to be sampling far faster than the signal moves. Now we've put some noise onto it. Let's assume we've got some high frequency noise here. The theory is that just taking our signal, if we've got a nice rate of decay there and rising, and there's delta there and delta there, if we now have 2 times s plus the previous sample, which is s plus delta, and the post sample is plus s minus delta, then the two errors there, the shift, the slopes, will cancel out, and in fact, that equation will reinforce the true signal we're interested in. Whereas what's happened with the noise is that that trough totally cancels out the two peaks in the noise and the noise will tend to zero. And what happens is if you process the array, you can actually see this happening. And I'll show you some demonstrations of this later of, of these actual algorithms really working. So it's a very simple technique. We use a weighted algorithm. The ratio, quite simply, is 1 to 1 to create the new array at each element. So each new element takes mostly its partner in the old array, a bit of the future, a bit of the past, to create a new array. And if that still doesn't work, you can repeat the process on this new array iteratively until you get the results you want, a nice smooth algorithm. It does work. So there we have three simple mathematical techniques. Low pass filters, running means, and smoothing algorithms. And all three of them achieve the same objective by slightly different mathematical techniques in that they remove high frequency noise from low frequency signals. You need to be able to write the programs to implement all three of those. Now, let's move on to some more complex concepts, which I don't expect to be able to write the programs, but I do at least expect you to be able to understand what's going on. 
I'll start with a very simple concept. Let's assume we have taken a whole load of data and um, it's noisy. So it looks, there's our samples of data. This is in time and there's amplitude. It's just a random selection of data. Now one thing that should be obvious to us is that there must be somewhere the best straight line that fits in these points. Clearly that is better than a line there or a line there. The theory is, is that, that given any scatter of points, if there's a linear relationship between the x and y coordinate, it must be possible for you to find the best line to fit those points. And that's done by a statistical process known as least squares fit. What we do is, is we take a guess. We draw what we think is the line. And then in Cartesian space, we drop a perpendicular from every one of our unknown points to that line. Why? Because that is the shortest distance from the real reading to our predicted best straight line. Now clearly, the length of these lines is a measure of how good the fit is. If we can minimise the lengths of all those lines, then we found the best straight line. And the way we do it, because some of these are positive and some are negative, we take the sum of the squares of these radiuses. If that is distance r, we sum them all, we square them all, we sum them all, and we calculate the sum of the squares of the error. That number is a measure of the goodness of our straight line. The greater the sum of the squares, the worse our guess is. I mean, you can look at that and do an obvious one. If I was to have drawn that line up there, clearly all these lines are far, far longer. Even if it had gone through there, far, far longer. So the sum of the squares is a measure of the quality of our, our line. If we seek to minimise that, to make it zero, if that was to equal zero, we have discovered the best line that fits that set of points, that set of data. Now this is a very old theory. It's been around for tens and tens and tens of years, probably longer. Long before computers, the idea of doing a least squares fit to find the best line to fit a set of points is a standard algorithm. You just get it out off the web or out of a textbook very very simple concept and so we would use least squares fit to post process data so what we do we sampling data we get our scatter of points we feed this into our least squares fit so we draw a line we calculate sigma r squared and then we tweak it about so I mean what's the equation of a straight line x equals a y plus b where that, a, that is the slope and that is the intercept with the axis. Very, very simple concept. So there's only two numbers to play with. So we try that, we draw a guess, we calculate what that is, and then we tweak it. So if we don't like that, so we, we decrement A a bit, redraw the line, try it again. If, they, if the new sigma r squared is less than the last sigma r squared, we're going in the right direction. If it's greater, we're going in the wrong direction. So we tweak the line up and down till we get the minimum value. Then we tweak the rotation. Then we tweak it up and down again. So you keep doing it in an iterative process. Now, doing that with a computer, you can do thousands of calculations very quickly. So a least squares fit to find the best straight line, in fact, is an extremely quick process when done with a computing machine. And you can feed in these set of points, you can get out the results. So if ever you need to uh, fit the, uh, uh, the straight line to a set of random points, just get a least squares fit algorithm out of a textbook and you can just plug it into your program. You can pull down off the web, I know I've seen them, you can pull down C subroutines that do it all for you. You just pass pointers to your array of X and Y data and it's done. So that's least squares fit. What this is leading up to, though, is the concept of regression. Now, the way the least squares fit us work is that we've got an equation 
that relates that gives us the straight line with only two parameters to play around. What happens though if we have a function that is continuous but is not a straight line? So we have x equals some function of y, whatever it is. We don't know what it is. It could be a sine wave, a log, cosine. As long as it is continuous, that is, there's no discontinuity in it, as long as we can write the equation x equals function y, that means that we can transform our data from whatever our variable function is into a straight line. If, it was, if we had x equals sine of y, we know that x is going to look like that, but y, which is the angle, is a straight line. So we can use the least squares fit concept, but not on the initial data. If we know that x equals some function of y, and let's assume here's our scatter of points that's a sine wave, if we apply the function, which this is the clue to regression, you must know what the continuous function is. If we apply that function to our data, we can transform our strange waveform into another set of dots that is, is in fact a straight line. Having done that, now we can do our least squares fit. And then once we've solved for the straight line, x equals a y plus b, we know what the function is. We can transform our straight line fit back into the continuous function, and we have solved the equation. Now, in fact, it's actually done in one go together combined. But what we have is the ability to do a iterative test on a set of data that's a continuous function and solve its curve fitting. It's the technique of curve fitting. As long as you know the nature of the function to start with, you can apply a curve fit algorithm to it and you can discover what the curve parameters are. And that process is known as regression. So if we have a summary, we've talked about some very simple techniques that happen in, t in space. That is, in uh, things that are continuing in real time and real space. We have low pass filters, we have regressions, least squares fits. Some of them you need to know about, some you need to code, some you just need to know exist. But not everything we're interested in, in a real time system, is in fact in the time domain. Sometimes we're interested in things that are happening in frequency as opposed to time. What am I talking about? Well, I'll give you an example. If you are trying to control a motor and you're interested in its rotation, it isn't a position you're interested in, it isn't time, it's a frequency. You're working in frequency space and it's not uncommon that what is of, of interest to you isn't the amplitude that something is happening, but how often it is happening. So we have to deal with effects not just in time, but also in frequency space as well. And there's a very well established technique called the Fourier transform that transforms time domain information into frequency domain information. So what it now happens is, is that if you have a set of curves, let's assume we have in time, and here's our amplitude x, some signal that is varying, here's, here's, this is time now, that's previous, and this is, this is what's about to come. We have a variable signal like that, in time, that can be transformed using a Fourier transform into a continual spectrum. In this case, there's a very strong frequency element there, which would be appear as two singular points there. You would end up with a spectrum that probably looks something like that in frequency space. Now, I not, do not expect you to be able to understand what Fourier transforms are about 
in 10 minutes of lectures. I just want you to know these things exist. And the purpose of a Fourier transform is a mathematical technique that takes time information and converts it into frequency information. Now the way it's done is that there is some horrendous equation which is the Fourier transform Ft is the integral of the function in time dt integrated over all time from minus infinity to plus infinity. And if you're already frightened by that you've every right to be because it is an horrendous theory it literally takes hours and hours and hours to calculate the Fourier transform, the complete spectra, of the simplest time domain signal. We just don't do it. However, we are interested in frequency information, so there must be a better way to do it. And there is, because the argument goes, look, in a real-time system, we're not looking at the whole spectrum, are we? we have a sample data system. The Fourier transform, as I'm trying to show in my, my drawings here, is to deals with complete samples, continuous from for all time and integrates over all time. But we don't do that. We actually have an ADC or, or some other input that samples, that takes regular samples. So we don't actually have the complete spectrum we have a series of samples. We know what's happening there, 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 and there. We have no knowledge of what's gone in in between because we're sampling. So what is the point of trying to implement in our computer these horrendous integrals over all time when we don't even have that information? And the argument goes, if you are sampling at a particular frequency, then the maximum frequency you could possibly measure is half that sampling rate. It's Nyquist's theorem. You just cannot get anything faster than that. If you're sampling at a rate of 100 hertz, the maximum frequency you can detect is 50 hertz. You can't go any faster. And even then, you can only actually detect discrete frequencies because there are certain frequencies you just can't see. You can only see the subharmonics of the sampling rate. So in fact, if you're sampling in time like that, that also means that you can only actually have knowledge if this is time interval t between the samples, then you can only actually have knowledge of frequencies with time intervals 1 over t at discrete frequencies. Now, once that was proven, now you don't need to bother with these continuous functions that calculate everything. All we need to do is to calculate the, the, the Fourier transform at these singular points. Because anything in between them cannot exist. If you're only sampling at a rate t in time, you can only have frequency information at 1 over t intervals in frequency space. Right, if you're still with me, and I hope you are, I'll do this again sometime, suddenly the ability to do Fourier transforms in a computer became possible. Instead of doing it in hours and hours and hours by trying to do the whole continuous spectrum, what was developed in the mid-1950s and 60s was a thing called the discrete Fourier transform. And all that did is it calculated the frequencies at these singular points. So the calculation changed from taking hours to a couple of minutes. But they were still very complex because what they were doing is they were still trying to implement this strange integral when in doing a long integration is still horrendous at each individual frequency, to solve for each frequency in turn. And that was still taking a lot of time. The great breakthrough was in the late 1960s when somebody realized, look, if you put all your time samples into an array, you've already inherently got all the frequency information in there. Because if you have an array, that's in, got data in at regular sample times. So you've got 
all these samples are separated by time t and this is our base time zero in the center this is minus time and that's plus time then if you look at the frequency spectrum everything that is going to contribute to a frequency one over time must be based on summing every single one of these so let's just add them all up and drop them into a box over here everything that is related to 1 over 2t means you just add that unit to that one to that one the odd one so you add all those together and drop those into a little box then 1 over 3t was every third sample 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 9 plus 12 so they added all of those up and then drop that into a little box all the way up to you finish the whole of the array which is 1 over n of, uh, of the array. So the argument goes, look, if you've already got regular time intervals, why do you any heavy calculations? You've already got inherently in your time information the frequency information. And what was developed was an algorithm that literally takes the time domain array, swaps all the boxes around, into different orders. As you can see, all we're doing is swapping boxes around here. We're not doing very difficult mathematics here. We're taking every sample and averaging it there. Every other sample dividing by two. Every third sample dividing by three. Every fifth sample divided by five, and so on and so on. What we end up with, in fact, in the bottom box, once you've reordered everything, uh, we actually end up with the frequency information actually in this new array and the whole thing was done is we've taken the time array to a uh, frequency array by doing no more than simple addition and averaging of alternate boxes depending on what frequency we want and this algorithm can be executed and completed with any computer in less than a second so what the fast Fourier transform gave us is the ability to calculate frequency information from real data in real time. And it's an incredibly powerful tool. So now let's review everything we've done in this lecture. We've been talking about different methods of digital signal processing. We've dealt with low pass filters. output n equals a times input n plus b times the output n minus 1 where a plus b equals 1 very simple algorithm removes high frequency information from noise running means what these are are a window an array of data we have our most recent sample going back to our oldest sample and we just average it and that's moving in time and that performs the same part uh, uh, trick as a low pass filter the difference here is there's always some history in this whereas this is the, only the most recent data but this uses far more code and data than that one so from a processing point of view a math point of view that's better than that but in terms of resources that's better than that and you've just got to balance the two up We've talked about smoothing algorithms where we take a weighted mean of an array of data on the ratio 1, 2 and 1 and then we create a new array that smooths out the noise. Now all three of these you need to understand, you need to be able to code them. But I also want you to know that a least squares fit is a technique for finding the best line through a scatter of points. That can be extended to a regression technique where we have a continuous function and we fit to the curve by transforming the data to the straight line, performing the same operation and transforming it back. And finally, you need to know about fast Fourier transforms, which takes information in the time domain and converts it into a spectrum in the frequency space. Neither of these do I expect you to code, but I do expect you to know what they are and know what their purpose is.
Right, now I'm going to show you a couple of demonstrations of some of these algorithms in real use. These are real programs and real instruments that my company has developed, um, and you've been given copies of them. One of them shows you how a regression operates, and the other one is a smoothing algorithm. I'll deal with the, the regression first. This instrument is the program from a skin rheometer. What it actually does is it measures the elasticity of human skin in vivo. So what we do is we take somebody's hand, we attach a probe, and then we rotate that probe slowly backwards and forwards, measuring both the force the skin, the restoring force the skin applies, and the uh, displacement that is uh, generated. Now if you put the two against each other, that is a measure of elasticity. Why would anybody do that? Well, it's of great interest to cosmetics companies, and this particular technique was developed by us for Procter & Gamble to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of their moisturizing cream range, oil of Ule, uh, because it is a, if you measure the elasticity, there it is known that the ability of a skin cream to moisturize the skin is also directly related to its elasticity. The more moist you are, the more elastic you are. When you're dried, then the skin becomes much taut and uh, tighter. So by measuring the elasticity of skin, we were able to measure how good the quality of the skin cream product is. And this is now being trialled by some other companies uh, around, the, around the world, actually, um, as a standard uh, technique for measuring elasticity. So let's look at how the program works. You've actually got it, it's called Skin DSR, where DSR is the dynamic skin rate of the skin. DSR is a standard mechanical term that measures elasticity. So if you now go to the computer screen, it's already set up, you can run this program yourself, and what it's saying is, is that we will have a a cycle time of 3 Hertz, that means that we will take 3 seconds to do the reading. We will apply a maximum force of 3 grams. There's a gain factor which is the gain of the PID loop um, that uses that is used to drive the motor. I'm going to leave that alone because this is merely a demonstration. And then we ask it to take a reading. What it does is it calculates the slope. This is simulating the readings back from a load cell and that measures load to 0.1 of a gram. So it's a very accurate measurement. And when it does it, it takes a whole series of points in a scatter. Now you might have seen that scatter come up and what I want to show you, these are real simulations of real results. The upper graph there is that horrible scatter of points. That actually is the real readings back from a load cell, the force readings. And what we've implemented is a linear regression of a sine wave that has fitted a sine wave to that data. Now the amplitude isn't important to us. What is important in the elastic terms is the ratio of the original driving force and the phase of the uh, the, the actual position that, it, uh, that um, the skin arrives at. Because pure elastic response, the, as soon as you apply a force to an elastic media, it will move immediately. Whereas if you have a viscous property, that always lags behind in time. So what we're interested in here is the phase shift. But I don't go into the science of skin cleans. What I wanted to show you was a linear regression in, in, in practice whereby a scatter of points that I think you'd agree is vaguely a sine wave and from that scatter of points we have solved what the sine wave is in terms of frequency and the phase shift and fitted that to both the force and position data. And that was done pretty quickly. So you can do, get these linear regressions can work extremely fast. Now if we come out of that I want to show you another example. And what I want to show you this time is a technique that we developed to measure the diameter of fibers. Now, how do we do that? Well, what we do is, is that we take, I'll actually use this, is that the system we're going to be on? Thank you. We actually do it with a laser. If we have a very thin fiber vertically and we use a laser beam, which is collimated light, Think of the fiber as being vertical into the paper. If we were to image that, what we would actually get 
is an image with a trough in it whereby the width of that trough is in fact a measure of the fibre. And if you've got a, um, a little bit of lens arrangement there and some very fine um, uh, sensing equipment here uh, on a mirror system uh, which is deflecting the light onto a single point detector, we actually get a scan that looks very much like this expanded. If we can measure the width of that gap, we know the width of the fibre. Now I'm going to show you some real traces from that to see if I can get the program to work. So we need to go back to the program. We want to come out of this one. We don't want to save those results. We want to get out of it totally. And I want to run my photonic demonstration of the data we would get from the laser beam. And this is, in fact, is, we, what I've done here is I've captured a real trace of one of the readings we, we got. Let's actually put it up. And here we have, if you look at the graph, what I'll do is we'll go back to this scanner here. I'll just draw it for you to show you what's happening. Then we'll go back to the computer picture. What you've seen here on the computer trace is that rising edge, the trough, and then that rising edge. Now that width there, that is the laser width. And that shadow there, that was due to the fibre. So the theory was, if we can find out the, the width there, we have, a, we have a measure of what the fibre is. Now we're just talking about microns width here. These are really, this is a hair fibre. Let's go back to the computer screen and you'll see that image. Now all I want to show you with this, the only reason I'm showing you this, one is just something different, but also to show you a smoothing algorithm. Because what I want to do is I need to expand this image, so I have to get my cursor over to the central point. We have a little yellow pointer that's running along the bottom. That might be in position. Ah, there we have, there we now have the actual trough itself. Now the problem with it is that it's quite fuzzy as you can see there's a lot well I know it's a bad picture anyway but even so I think you, you can appreciate that there is some fine detail lacking there I'm going to put up some cursors and what I have here is a cursor on the left a cursor on the right and the theory was for our early experience with this is that if we move these cursors in to the points where we're interested in operating, and then if we bring up a third cursor, the idea was was that we automatically locate a particular baseline and we snap the left and right cursors to the width and this is so we could do some analysis. Uh, that really is by the way for you. What is of interest is at the moment this is unsmoothed data. Now for most of the curve we are able to actually extract the width quite, care quite easily but some points it gets a bit rough and ready. Ah now we've got a different area and I want to show you a point there that is a very crude curve in blue that is after the application of the smoothing algorithm and I hope you'll agree that we have gone just looking at the cyan blue picture there we have a very coarse image that has come straight out off of the um, detector in front of the laser and by the application of a single smoothing algorithm just once around the loop we generate the red curve and that has substantially improved the linearity of the curve. So there we have without smoothing and with smoothing and I hope that is a demonstration to you without smoothing with smoothing that this very very simple algorithm this is this weighted algorithm of one two and one can take some quite rough data and turn it back into some very usable information. Very simple post-processing technique. So that concludes the lecture on digital signal processing.
Welcome back. Real-time systems, I'm going to deal with section 10 of the notes now, very briefly. There isn't much we need to do on this. System integrity. What do we mean by system integrity? Well, when you're driving your car and you press a pedal, you expect the car to do what you tell it to do. You can't have a computer crashing in a real-time system. And if you were to go along to a used car dealer and start driving a car down the road and it kept on crashing, you'd be extremely annoyed. Why we put up with it with computers, I don't know. We seem to think it's perfectly acceptable for computers to crash, for software not to work, uh, to have to have updates all the time, even though you've already paid for something. We wouldn't expect that or accept that in any other product we buy. When we buy a car, we expect it to work. When we buy a washing machine, we accept, expect it to wash the clothes. A dishwasher should uh, clean our crockery. A microwave should cook our dinner. Why on earth we're prepared to buy computers, which we all know are going to fail within a few weeks, is beyond my comprehension. And I think the computer industry has taken us all for a ride for far too long. You can't get away with that sort of sloppy practice in real-time system programming because when you are controlling a motor, it's got to work. So system integrity is an integral part of program development in that you need to ensure that the system works. This is all comes down to the concept of good design practice and self-testing. And I'll run through some ideas. What could go wrong in a computer? Well, one of them is, is that the program itself has been corrupted. To overcome this, we use a technique known as a ROM checksum. All real-time, these are standard practices, all real-time systems have these features. What is a ROM checksum? Well, what that is, is that we have in somewhere in memory, we have our program code. Before we run the code, we have to prove to ourselves it hasn't been corrupted or overwritten in any way. How do we do that? Well, code is just a whole load of numbers, a whole load of bytes. If we do a sum of all the bytes in the checksum, normally we do it as a 16-bit value, and then we write into the top end of the program memory the checksum, burned into the code, we have the ability to check it's not been corrupted. So what we have before we start, our bootstrap loader should look at the program code, recalculate the checksum and compare it to the stored checksum in the memory before we execute the code. So what we're doing is we're checking with a very simple mathematical technique that nothing has gone wrong with the program before we even run it. A ROM checksum is a standard requirement for all real-time systems. In fact, most compilers and assemblers will, if you request it, automatically drop at the end of any block of code the checksum for all the preceding code so that you can automatically implement the ROM checksum facility. So what we're talking about is a means to ensure our program code has not been corrupted. You perform a mathematical operation on the program code itself, store in part of the program what that result is, and then some other program, the bootstrap or the real-time executive or the operating system, performs the identical mathematical operation, checks that against the stored checksum to ensure the program code itself has not been corrupted. So the ROM checksum is a technique to check that the code itself is okay and has not been destroyed or overwritten or corrupted before the program is run. Very simple technique. What about our data area? What about our memory? Well, here we have a far more complex problem. Now, one of the simplest solutions to checking that memory is okay is to do RAM pattern tests. So what we do, we take every memory location and we write into it a series of patterns. Traditionally, we use hex AA 
and hex 55. That's 1010101 and 01010101. So what we do is for every memory location we write AA and then 55 and read it back. This tests that every single bit in the memory is capable of receiving a write of a logic level 0 and a logic level 1, so you've tested every bit. So that's how you test the patterning. But how do you know you've gone to the right memory location? Because another, one of the, another failure you may get in random access memory isn't that the data is being corrupted, but the address you're writing to has been corrupted. And bear in mind, these are real-time systems, so they're in dirty, harsh environments on printed circuit boards. It only needs a bit of swarf or metal or grease to get into the box to land on the circuit board. It could very easily short out two address pins of a processor's RAM and that way you'll get RAM address errors. So you'll be writing to the wrong memory location. How can we get around that? Well, before we can do pattern tests, we've got to prove we're writing to the right memory location. One of the ways to do that is that if you've got a block of memory, say from 00 to FF, you write into each and every memory location its own address, 00, 01, 02, 03, 04, all the way up in blocks of 256 in order. Now, if you read back from these memory locations their contents, the contents of each RAM address, read each location, should hold its own address. If there had been an addressing problem, then one of those numbers would have been incorrectly written into the wrong memory location, and thus you have detected an addressing fault. And I'm serious, these things happen. So it is normal practice before you power up any real-time system, you should do a RAM address check. Once you've proven that every address can be uniquely accessed, then you can do your pattern tests. Now, one of the very first bits of kit I showed you in lecture one was the controller from a gas cooker. Over half that program time is actually taken up with integrity and self-testing. Because one thing you do not want is a domestic cooker going wrong while it's baking a cake because that could be 20 minutes by which time you've burnt the house down. So these tests are actually done every second. The whole of the RAM is loaded and tested with its own address. We don't just do RAM pattern tests of AA and 55. We actually load every number from 00 through to FF into each RAM location individually and we read it back. So we prove the whole of the gas cooker is working safely and we had to do that to get approvals from the gas authorities to market that product in Europe. So those are RAM pattern tests. So what these two things are doing is they've tested the code space works with a, code with a ROM checksum. The RAM space can be addressed properly and you can write data into every RAM location. But once you start using your program, then you've got to make sure that dynamically things are working correctly as well. So we also have this art concept, once you've proven the RAM is going, you also have a RAM checksum as well. And that is the same concept as a ROM checksum, except you have to dynamically recalculate it. And you only ever apply it to a crucial block of memory, such as setup or alarm data or something that is extremely important. Every time you change, this could be blocks of memory, and every time any location is changed, you recalculate a checksum for the whole of the block of RAM. So what we have here is a block of crucial data that is checked by having a checksum written every time it's updated. And again, what you ought to do with some bootstrap loader or regular intervals with a real-time interrupt, say once every five seconds, is recalculate that checksum and compare it to the last stored value. In that way, you're proving that your program isn't going haywire as well. 
because your program, even though it's not perfectly good RAM, could waltz all over important data and corrupt it. So by creating a checksum for blocks of crucial data, you have the ability then to test that other routines and programs haven't corrupted important safe data by recalculating the checksum and rechecking it. Very important concept. How do you check that things are actually executing? Because even though your code is working, your RAM is working, you can write data, you can read things back, there's no guarantee you haven't written a whole load of rubbish in your program that makes the program crash or die. How do we solve that? Well, the standard technique is to use a device called a watchdog. Now, a watchdog is a totally independent piece of circuitry that is independent of your computing system. And it's just a timer. And what it actually controls is a signal to the power on reset signal of the processor. And what happens is, is that it is always timing out. And it's the job of your program every now and again to output a pulse to the watchdog, i.e. the term kicking the watchdog, to reset it back to zero. If your program crashes, so what you do is you have a nice program loop and at the end of it you output the pulse. If your program crashes, then it won't output the pulse, the watchdog will time out and it will issue a warning or a reset and it will restart your computer, reload the bootstrap loader. Or alternatively, if it's an even more crucial system, it may switch on um, a power down system that gracefully degrades your system to a safe state and then outputs an alarm. So a watchdog is an external piece of circuitry that's monitoring the performance of your computer. If your computer fails to reset the watchdog at regular intervals, the watchdog times out and it forces a bootstrap reset of your processing system, restarts it and then puts it into a safe situation, a very important system. Let's take watchdogs a little bit further because you may actually have a multi-processor system. Bear in mind that real-time systems don't tend to be continuous loops. They're usually uh, parallel processes, multiple functions operating independently. They're usually interrupt-driven systems, which will be discussed in another lecture. So, if we have a pair of parallel processes, so let's assume here's one process running around and here's another process, we cannot actually just have one of those processes kicking the watchdog. Because if this is, let's say, a background routine, and this is some form of real-time interrupt that is doing our data sampling in control, all we're proving is that that function is running, but not that one. It's not, no way to prove parallel processing. So we can't do it this way. What we have to do is to pass a semaphore from each function that must be running to the function that kicks the watchdog. So what we have to do is this process has to set a signal flag to inform that process that I'm okay. And then when that process comes round to kick the watchdog, it has to confirm one, that process is all right, it's all right, and only then will it kick the watchdog. So you can use watchdog not just to prove your program is running, but by good program design that each and every section of your program is running. All your parallel processes in your real-time system should set a flag to say, I am executing OK. And then the watchdog routine that is monitoring everything should make sure that each individual process is executing its own function in the correct sequence at the correct time. And only then, by looking at these signals, will it kick the watchdog. So let's just have a rating break. System integrity, an important concept when a real-time system runs, you have to ensure that the processor has not crashed. Various techniques. The simplest one is the ROM checksum. 
we do a mathematical operation on the program code and we store a constant somewhere. When we power up our system, we should recalculate that sum and compare it to the stored checksum. And that is a way of checking that we have not crashed our computer system, that the code is still OK and we can run it. Data memory, though, we have other problems. We have to check both that the addressing is OK and the data. So what you should do is you should write the address of each RAM location into itself and check the right address has been written. That way you will prove that you can uniquely address each individual box in the memory. Once you've done that, then you should load patterns into it to prove that each individual bit is settable and resettable. Only then can you start your real-time system. And these are standard techniques you will find in all real-time systems, or rather every quality real-time system. Dynamic tests on the RAM are also equally important. You should have a RAM checksums. Take blocks of crucial data, perform a checksum on it and store that somewhere else. Regularly you should go back, recalculate the, the, the checksum of the dynamic data, compare it back to the stored result, and that gives you confidence that other routines are not altering or corrupting important data variables. Finally, to monitor everything, you have a watchdog. A watchdog is an external piece of circuitry that is a timer. If it times out, then it forces a bootstrap reset of the processor. So it's the job of your program every now and again to say, I'm all right, reset the watchdog or kick the watchdog, set it back to zero. If you have a multi-function uh, real-time system, which is what you normally do, parallel processes, you can't just have one of those kicking the watchdog. You have to have a series of signals or semaphores from each individual process. They should all set a flag saying, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. And if all your functions are running correctly, only then should the watchdog maintenance function kick the watchdog and set it back to zero. System integrity is essential. It's a key part of any program because the things you're designing could hurt people. And certainly in the European Union, as of January the 1st, 1998, the software engineers can be held liable for death or injury caused to other people as a result of poor programming practice. So you should build in uh, system integrity into any program that is going to control uh, machinery or equipment that could cause injury or damage to other people. Now we really ought to give some consideration as well to system testing. It's all well and good having all these wonderful techniques to keep things alive once they're running, but really you should try and find as many of the faults in your program, well all of the faults in your program, before you ever get into production with it. And so system testing forms a part of this module, section 11, and I want to introduce to you four very simple tools that are used to test the integrity of a program that is going to go into production. Because bear in mind, once you've made 100,000 washing machines, you can't issue a patch program as you do with some internet browser programs. Once they're out there, you cannot afford to recall them. You've got to get your programs right first time. One of the main ways of achieving that is good engineering and design practice. I'm not going to lecture you on that. You should all know how to write and design good programs and how to apply good engineering practice to generating programs. The last thing you should be doing is running off and clacking at a keyboard. If you design your program first, get clear in your head what the specification is, the requirements, the data flows, the state changes, the functionality, and you can express that as a design then that design can be tested and then you write the code it's the last thing you ought to do is writing a program you should design your programs first 
That's the difference between the extremely well paid system analysts who do the design work and the poor old programmers who don't get paid as much money because they just clack at a keyboard and there's a lot of difference. How do we test these things? Well, there's two main classes of tool you might come across. There are tools that are software orientated that just test the software. And there are tools that test the software embedded into the electronics. And that's probably a bit more important. Let's run through one of the software tools. And we'll build up this little tree as we go along. So for testing, down the software route, we have a thing called a simulator. Now, what is a simulator? Well, for those of you who've started the coursework, you will know that one quarter of the actual practical marks is given to you for using a simulator. A simulator is a program that, as the word implies, simulates the operation of your target system. It's usually a program runs on a clever computer that simulates the operation of a simple one. You will be given a copy of MPSIM, which is the industry standard simulator for simulating PIC programs. And I expect you to do something with it by the end of this module. What a simulator does is it normally takes in the program code and it simulates its operation. It allows you to look at registers and variables to step through your program and see how it operates, the program flow. But it's not done in real time, nor it is a real imagery of the processor. It's only a simulation, it's a mimic, it's not for real. But you can actually find using simulators a lot of problems with the flow of your program and the data handling. And many uh, uh, systems, many programs are launched on the market with only having ever used a simulator and none of these other tools. Why? Because they are free. You get them free off of the web or from the manufacturer. They're just software tools that simulate the operation, but they're pretend. Another class of software tool which you're going to see less of these days, is an emulator. But this is leading us on to something else. Now, what is an emulator? An emulator is where you have a clever computer and all of the resources you find on your simple computer, you can also find on the clever computer. So, for example, if you've got a Intel 80... 51 processor, let us say, simple microcontroller, you will have on that a number of registers, uh, an A register, a B register, and a few other registers. You could map all of those onto a Pentium. So you could say, well, we'll just use a little bit of the AX 32 bit register to represent the A register of the 8051, and we use a little bit of the BX 32 bit processor to perform the same operation of the B register in the simple 8051. So we try and map onto our clever computer all the little bits of the architecture of the simple computer. And if we can do that, then we have the ability to create an emulator. Because what an emulator does is it translates the program for the simple computer into the instructions, the identical instructions to run on the clever computer. And now we can run our real program in real time, but on a larger target system. So it's identical in an operation to all intents and purposes to a simulator. It will execute our program, but it is able to do it in real time and because we're talking about developing real-time systems it's the timing impl implications that may be important to you. Another example is for example the whole Apple Mac family that uses the Motorola 68000 processor. Why it's not the world leader I do not know. The Apple Mac computer is so superior to the Pentium it's beyond belief. The Pentium processor can drop into a small fraction of a Apple Mac processor. That's why it's possible to go and buy an Apple Mac and to have true emulation of the Windows operating system because it runs under emulation mode. The Apple Mac Motorola processor has 32 32-bit registers. Every one can form any function you like. Data, address pointers, base pointers, stack pointers. The Pentium 
has got 16 32-bit registers, but each one is restricted to a specific operation only. So it's extremely easy to map the whole of an IBM PC into a fraction of an Apple Mac. And so you can run everything you like you could on a PC on an Apple Mac in true emulation mode. That is an example of emulation being used to give you commercial clout. So an emulator is where we actually run the program of a simple computer, i.e. a Pentium, on a cleverer computer, a Motorola 68000, the identical code, just by a simple code translation. In terms of testing, though, you're unlikely to find emulators these days. Most work is done with simulators and with another type of tool, which is known as an in-circuit emulator. Let's add that to our little family of devices. The in-circuit emulator is a hardware tool. What it does is, instead of running the processor in our board, what we've got in the processor, you've got a chip with lots of registers and memory. What we really want to do is to run our program in our chip, in our board, in real time, driving the real electronics, the real ADCs, but we'd like to know what's going on inside it. Well, there are things that do this for us. They're called bond-out chips. And what a bond-out chip is, if you look at the die of a processor, let's assume here's the die and here's the pins for the device, and you've got lots of microcircuits all over it. They literally bond onto the, uh, the IC itself wires, hundreds of wires, that allow a high-speed data acquisition unit to capture in real time all the activity in the processor. So what you're able to do with an in-circuit emulator is to run your program in your real computer, your real board with your real peripherals, and at the same time you have this pod that sucks out of the IC, the processor, all the activity and stores it into a high-speed data store running at megahertz faster than your processor so what you're able to do is to run your program in real time with the real electronics and then you can stop it and look at a picture of the say the last hundred milliseconds activity and stored in the high speed data store is everything that's gone on in the processor Needless to say, these things are wonderful devices and horrendously expensive. I mean, typically you're going to have to spend from five to ten thousand pounds for any quality in circuit emulator. But at the end of the day, if that's the only way to solve your problem, well, I normally hire them for a day or two. Most of my work I do with simulators, and if necessary, a last resort, I will hire an emulator from an equipment manufacturer and get the job done. They're far too expensive to buy, especially when you need one for every different processor. It's a different bond-out chip and a different pod. But there is an alternative. We've got here in our table the uh, in-circuit emulator, but another tool that you will come across is a thing called a logic analyzer. Now in fact a logic analyzer was originally developed for electronic engineers. What it is, it's a multi-beam scope. It's just an oscilloscope and it's a storage scope. Uh, and it was developed for, de for, dis for testing digital electronics, where there are lots and lots of fast moving signals. So they're multi-beam oscilloscopes, typically 16 or 24 traces. Again, they're an expensive tool, but not as expensive as an in-circuit emulator. The trick is, let's remember a processor, a microcontroller, has 8 bits for a data bus, 16 bits for the address bus. If you take a multi-beam scope, and you clip the pins in order around the processor. So rather than having the bond out that's coming from inside the processor, you clip the logic analyzer pins onto the processor pins itself on the PCB. It's possible to capture into a fast data acquisition unit all of the bus transactions going backwards and forwards on the external data bus of the device. If we can synchronize that with the machine fetch cycle 
and translate that binary back into assembly language, it means we can perform the identical operation to an in-circuit emulator, yeah. but by capturing the activity outside the chip rather than inside. So what you can buy, you can actually buy in-circuit emulator personality modules for logic analyzers, which are just clips that clip outside the computer capture all the bus activity on the pins, store it into a data store so you can still run your program in real time on your own electronics and you can capture snapshots of activity on the processor in the data store and then you can look and see how your program moved through a program. Now the difference between the in-circuit emulator and the logic analyzer, the in-circuit em emulator is able to look inside the chip it can look at the contents of the registers, the flag, the status, and you pay a lot of money for that. But a lot of real-time testing, all you want to know is how did the program flow through? Did it go from A to B to C? Did it do the correct branch at the right place? And a lot of that information you can obtain simply by looking at the bus activity outside the processor. So sometimes the logic analyzer is a nice low-cost alternative for testing. So let's run through our four types of testing again. Simulators simulate the operation of your program in a clever computer, but it's not real time. You are required to play with MPSIM as part of your coursework, see how it operates and give me an opinion. I know most of you will say it's a load of rubbish, but of course we're dealing with a different end of the spectrum. If you think it's a load of rubbish, I don't care. You tell me what you think. As long as you use it, it will give you an introduction to a real tool as used in industry. An emulator is a software technique that maps the simple processor onto a cleverer processor whereby we can run our programs in real time by a simple code translation. But it's still not in the target system. In-circuit emulators are very expensive, the creme de la creme of the tools. It uses a bond out chip whereby we have very fine wires bedded into the processor itself so we can suck out of it all of the information activity within the processor while the program is running and we can free snapshots on what's going in. So you unplug your, your processor, you plug in the pod from the in-circuit emulator, you run your program in real time with real electronics, real hardware, and you're capturing the activity in a high-speed data acquisition unit. If you can't afford one of those and they are expensive, you may get away with a logic analyzer which you clip the pins on the outside of the processor and it captures the bus activities as it runs through your program. And they're normally, well, you can get them actually. I've seen them for under a thousand pounds, some uh, low cost logic analyzers. So they are sometimes a very good alternative for testing your system.